which is So hello everybody and welcome to this London Climate Action Week, Week event which has been organised by the Stop the Silvertown Tunnel Coalition. Um, the subheading here, here is Sustainable Transport, yes! Silvertown Tunnel, no! Um, because we believe that the two things are mutu mutually incompatible. Um, the Silvertown Tunnel, um, I'm sure um, most of you here, all of you here probably are aware, it's a road tunnel um, that's planned between um, Silvertown in Newham in the north and um, Greenwich uh, Peninsula in the south. And it'll run from alongside the Blackwall Tunnel to, um, but it, um, from Greenwich it will be alongside the Blackwall Tunnel, but it actually is going to come out in Newham, much further to the east of the Blackwall Tunnel. And um, we have many, we are meant, there are many good reasons to be opposing the tunnel. Um, air pollution locally is, is one, um, and to, but for many other reasons that we'll be hearing about. Um, but before I introduce the panel, let's very briefly say um, who is not here tonight, um, which is um, Heidi Alexander is the Deputy Mayor for Transport and we asked her um, some time ago, as soon as we knew we were doing this event, we asked her to um, come along and um, take part in the debate but um, we've been told quite late on that no, she wouldn't be able to come and no, nobody else could substitute for her. So unfortunately, we've not got anybody um, from the mayor's office, but we're kind of used to that now because the last time, I, I can't remember, was there, was there ever a time where um, anybody from the, um, either the mayor or the deputy mayor's actually engaged in debate about the tunnel? I'd, really um, the major public meetings that we've had here going back to 2019 um, nothing nobody is coming from that side of the debate but we do have a fantastic panel here and we're going to start um, we're going to hear from each of the panel and then we'll you'll all have your chance to ask questions afterwards so we're going to start first of all with Rebecca Lush who is with us from the um, Transport Action Network. Rebecca's a, a veteran anti-road uh, expansion campaigner um, and we're hoping for some tips. So I'll hand you over to Rebecca. Good afternoon everyone. Um, so yeah I'm Rebecca Lush and I'm the local campaign support officer at Transport Action Network or TAN as we're known as. Um, I became an environmental campaigner at the age of 20 in 1992 when I became very involved in the campaign to prevent the M3 motorway being bulldozed through Twyford Down, which was very close to where I grew up. And this protest kick-started a national movement against road building in the 1990s, like a precursor to uh, Extinction Rebellion. It was the first environmental direct action in this country. And it was against Margaret Thatcher's huge roads programme. And I was very proud to play a leading part in those protests. Um, through a powerful combination of feisty local community groups, um, environmental NGOs like Transport 2000, which became Campaign for Better Transport, CPRE, Friends of the Earth, headline grabbing peaceful direct action at the M11 in London at Newbury, and academic research like the seminal Sacra report of 1994, which concluded that new roads create more traffic. After all of this, the roads programme was first cut from 600 schemes down to 300 and then halved again to 150 schemes. And by 1997, we'd successfully defeated the entire £30 billion roads programme with the new incoming Labour government promising to end road building and invest in the sustainable alternatives instead. Of course, the fuel protests of uh, 2000 put pay to that aspiration and it didn't work out. But and here we are again, 24 years later, still battling these same old road schemes with politicians still addicted to mega vanity projects. In March last year, the government announced a 
new £27 billion RIS2 roads programme of 50 major road schemes and smart motorways. Transport Action Network, who I work for, is currently embroiled in a legal battle against the Department for Transport as they failed to assess the impact of this roads programme on climate change before giving it the go ahead. Over a year after initiating this legal action, we're finally facing the DFT in the High Court in two days time on, on Tuesday in London. So please wish us luck. We're also separately legally challenging the government's planning policy for road building, which literally instructs decision makers to ignore climate change. So we should hear very soon whether the courts have given us permission to proceed with that case. And around the country, many local authorities are planning and promoting more road schemes. And of course, here in London, Transport for London are ploughing on, regardless of all the evidence on the harms, with the Silvertown Tunnel costed at an eye-watering £2.2 billion. It does sometimes feel like deja vu and that we've all gone back to the 1990s. But things have dramatically changed, however, and we're fighting within such a different campaigning landscape to then. And the most obvious and significant change is that we have the Climate Change Act, and that has, this act has got teeth and it's got targets. The government has recently accepted the Committee on Climate Change's recommendation that we need 78% cuts in carbon emissions by 2035. Road transport is the single largest contributor to UK carbon emissions and not only that but it's the only sector not to have fallen significantly since 1990. So it's for me and I think the most critical sector of emissions to tackle in the UK. And the current government, the, yeah, the government's current plan if you could call it that is to rely on all of us switching to ele electric vehicles. However, the proposed ban on new fossil fuel on new fossil fuel powered cars won't come in until 2030. And so the old fossil fuel powered fleet will still be on the road for another 10 to 15 years after that. So the cold hard facts are that the cuts to road transport emissions that are needed aren't going to happen fast enough if we're to meet that 78% cut by 2035 that the Committee on Climate Change has set. And that we have to reduce traffic now by switching car journeys to walking, cycling and public transport and just generally reducing the need to travel. Other things that have um, changed, the Scottish Government has committed to a 20% traffic reduction target by 2030 and just this week the Welsh Government has suspended all road building due to concerns on, of, about climate change and they've ordered an independent review of all road schemes to see if they contribute to our net zero commitments. So the Department for Transport and Transport for London are looking increasingly backward and isolated with their outdated 20th century road building plans. But things will start to come unstuck for the DFT and Transport for London this week as very dramatically the Committee on Climate Change published its 2021 progress report to Parliament which said that new roads should only be built if they can be shown not to increase emissions. And this is the first time that the powerful Committee on climate change have said this and this is major shift and intervention should not be underestimated. Roads can be stopped at the last minute. In the late 1990s the um, A30 in Dorset which went through the National Trust's Golden Cap Estate which had been through public inquiry, the compulsory purchase had all been made, purchase orders had all been made, the planning consent had already been granted but it was stopped not at the 11th hour but the 11th hour and 59th minute through political pressure. There had to be an act of parliament to revoke the planning consent and the CPOs, but it can be done likewise with the Oxley's Wood scheme in the 1990s. At the last minute, these schemes can be cancelled through political pressure and pressure from the grassroots up. So my advice is don't give up, don't ever give up. The political landscape is changing daily as road building becomes more and more untenable. And the truth is that road building and encouraging more traffic growth is completely incompatible with reducing road transport emissions. Sadiq Khan and Boris Johnson cannot have it both ways. They cannot cl claim to be climate leaders, yet still be planning these big road schemes that belong in the last century. It's time to cancel the RIS2 build, road building programme and the Silvertown Tunnel. <laughs> if we didn't all if we weren't all muted i'm sure you'd be able to hear the claps um that was great thank you very much rebecca 
And now we're moving to um, Simon Pirani, who is um, the author of uh, A Global History of Fossil Fuels Burning Up and um, an energy researcher, an honorary professor at University of Durham and author of a report into the um, climate change aspects of the Silvertown Tunnel, which um, is basically called Stop Digging. <laughs> um, so pass you to pass you over now to Simon. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Kate. I, you probably, I think everybody on this call will know that slogan, um, think global, act local. And I want to focus on the think global part um, and talk about the way that were this tunnel to be built, and I agree with uh, Becker, it can be stopped, but were it to be built, it would feed in to uh, the global problem of, of climate change uh, in a way that I'll try to describe. The problem is greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, let's quickly talk about the construction of the tunnel. Uh, my back of the envelope arithmetic says that, and I'm working with the figure from Transport for London, they haven't done a life cycle analysis, by the way, or anything proper like that, but they have given this figure, and my uh, back of the envelope calculation says it's like 600 return, return trips to New York uh, by a Boeing 737-400. That's just to build the tunnel. That's not the real problem, however. The real problem is the one that Becca mentioned, more roads produce more traffic. By expanding the road network, the tunnel makes space for more journeys by cars and HGVs, and that's a big source of greenhouse gas emissions, not only here, but internationally. And in fact, there are whole scientific papers by researchers who say that all, all fossil fueled infrastructure, which includes these road projects, must stop now if there's to be any chance of reaching the targets that have been set uh, by uh, the international climate talks. So uh, I've got some slides here I'm going to try to share. This is hitting the outer bounds of my technical capability. Um, here we are. There we go. Um, I'll try and make that a bit bigger for you. Um, okay, I've got a slide there about climate change is hurting people now. And I think everybody in this call is probably aware of this. I always look at the World Meteorological Organization reports. The one for 2020 says 9.8 million people were displaced in the first half of uh, 2020 for reasons uh, either directly or indirectly connected with uh, climate change, disruption to agriculture, flooding, drought. Uh, this is happening now, okay? Not, not in 20 or 30 years time. Um, what this shows is that uh, this is a, a graph which shows the things that Greta Thunberg, that the school students, that Extinction Rebellion today out in the streets in London are, uh, talking about is the gap between words and action. Um, the green line is the way that climate scientists, this is from a, the Twitter feed of Glenn Peters of the uh, Cicero Institute, who's quite a prominent climate scientist who speaks out a lot. Um, and the green line is the way that he and his colleagues say things have to go if we're going to get net, net zero emissions by 2050. The yellow line are the announced uh plans and we all know how often politicians plans work out and the blue line are the actual stated policies of governments right so this is not just Sadiq Khan and Heidi Alexander this is an international problem of a gap between um words and action now if you look at the uh, this next slide uh, this is one from an important paper by scientists at the Tyndall Centre about UK carbon policy. And what you see is that the gap that there is internationally is at national level as well. So I've, uh, the, the very inexpert uh, colours have been added by me. Uh, the original graphs uh, just with the, is the black, <laughs> um, is the black lines. And uh, you can see the blue um, a path, which is the CCC pathway. And I, I, I mean, with the CCC, I think Becca's right. When they, when they criticize the government and speak up, they can be very good. But even the carbon budgets they're working with are way, way behind what has to be done. 
right? So it'd be great if the government listened to the CCC, but it wouldn't quite solve all the problems uh, because what we see is that there's a gap between their uh, line and the line that I've uh, highlighted in green, which is where the scientists at Tyndall Center are saying, you have to go for the UK, and the, the, the crucial word is fair. This is for the UK to make its fair contribution internationally. And what the CCC and the government are doing is uh, not coming out clearly and identifying how the idea of uh, rich countries making a greater contribution will uh, flow out in practice. That's all very muddy and very unclear in their documents. Whereas the Tyndall scientists say, look, this is the figure we think is the absolute most the developing countries, the global south could possibly do. And this is what's left for the rich countries. And we better flaming well get on with it. Um, now, then you said this is a third graph. And again, you see lines with gaps between them. And uh, that blue line, I think these colors are wrong, but never mind. I don't know why I've got transport for London in green. Um, but uh, the blue line, that's again what the tin, so the scientists at Tyndall Center have actually gone through the whole country and looked at the local authorities. That's the line they see uh, for London. That's the way they see London's emissions should be going down. And what you see is it's going down sharply in the 2020s. Now, uh, the, 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 the politicians' aspirations, all the things going right, all the promises being carried out, we know how often that happens, that's the green line. But the really scary line on this graph for me is the Transport for London line. That's a line that uh, Andrew Boswell and I worked out from the operational documents that the guys at TFL who actually run the road system, that's the basis they're working on. Nothing like the 20% cut uh, that Becca mentioned that the Scottish government's now going for. Nothing like actually what the GLA says it's going for. Just miles out, just carrying on like before, business as usual. So that's the problem and that's why, that, and that's the sense in which the Silvertown Tunnel is part of a bigger uh, problem. And so uh, Becca's already covered some of this. 28% of UK carbon emissions are from transport. Transport's the one that's been going um, up while the others have been going down. Uh, Wales has frozen, uh, as Becca mentioned, all these new uh, road building programs. And I think uh, the um, Deputy Climate Minister of the Welsh Government uh, said it all, if we carry on going as we're going, we're not going to hit net zero until 2090. Scientists tell us we have until uh, 2050 to stop this running out of control. So. Uh, climate change often seems like a really daunting uh, global problem and, and we sit at home worrying what on earth can we do about something so big. Well the answer is sometimes we can act local and by stopping the Silvertown Tunnel we can stop another uh, brick in the wall of things uh, that is going to obstruct uh, tackling dangerous climate change. Thanks. Lots of applause, if only you could hear it, Simon. <laughs> They're all muted still. Um, thank you very much. And now we're going to go to our next speaker, who is Ruth Fitzharris from Lung, Mum for Lung, Mums for Lungs, who I had the great pleasure of hearing speak at the Stop the Silvertown Tunnel um, rally that we had in East London. Um, about three weeks ago now, wasn't it? And your speech was standout um, emotionally um, strong. And um, yeah, I was really glad you were there and I'm really glad you're here with us again. So um, I'll pass you over to Ruth Fitzharris. There we go, can you hear me now? Okay. Um, hi, I'm here as a volunteer from Mums for Lungs, which is a network of people, it's not just mums, who are campaigning for clean air so that children can breathe safely. Um, evidence is mounting that air pollution is contributing to a range of serious and life-limiting health problems. Um, asthma, low birth rate, cancers, dementia, respiratory conditions, um, it goes on at the moment. Um, I've had personal experience of this as my son's been in hospital multiple times with breathing difficulties and we were told by a consultant to stay away from traffic. Um, so Mums for Lungs does broadly does three things. Uh, we work to raise awareness of the air pollution crisis. 
um, provide materials to support communicating this message urgently, um, leaflets, posters, social media messaging, letters, etc. Um, please get in touch with us if you want to access any of these resources. Um, Mums for Lungs campaigns also to all levels of policy makers for schemes that will reduce air pollution at source. Um, we've been very vocal in campaigning um, for ULES in London um, and for strong targets in the Environment Bill um, because goals and policies that tackle the climate emergency would also reduce air pollution. Um, we also mobilised uh, parents to campaign for school streets. Um, there are now over 100, uh, sorry, 400 school streets in operation where roads are closed around schools in the um, morning and afternoon um, drop off and pick up times. And finally, we also get involved in um, specific campaigns um, such as the Silver Pound Tunnel, where lo local groups are doing really fantastic work that will help to reduce air pollution. Um, Newham suffers from poor air quality, and a report in, um, on child health by the Public Health in by Public Health England, published in June 2018, found that Newham has significantly worse than the national average hospital admissions for asthma. Um, and over 4,000 children in the borough have diagnosed asthma and that's underestimated. Um, so, sorry about that. Um, transport and wood burning are the two main sources of air pollution. Um, we, um, we need to drive far less, I don't, I don't really need to say that, that's, that's um, clear. Um, but alternatives to car use need to be promoted urgently um, and radically uh, to, to be able to change things for, for this generation of children. Um, looking, at, looking at the plans at the moment um, and seeing children suffer now, I'm thinking this is gonna be too late for them, um, which is really, really depressing. Um, but, not only is excessive driving creating air pollution, but it's also a double whammy because it's putting people off from making the choice to cycle. Um, so driving these kind of trips that could otherwise be done by public, public transport or by walking needs to really be discouraged. Um, every journey is a contributor to the problem. And Mums for Lungs is on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. Uh, we have a web page, www.mumsforlungs.org please get in touch with us um, if you would like to join our campaigning work. Everybody is welcome to join whether you're a parent or not. Um, and our next meeting is on the 14th of July. Thank you. Sorry, that was a bit <laughs> garbled. <laughs> no, it wasn't. <laughs> it's really great to hear from you. Um, and I'm sure that um, I've I think there are, there are quite a few um, parents here that I recognise. Um, I'm sure they'll have questions for you afterwards, Ruth, about how, um, how we can organise locally um, in Greenwich and Newham. Um, so our next speaker, we may not have um, anybody from the Mayor's office, but we do have um, some strong uh, um, speakers from the Labour Party. The first is John Burke, who's the former Hackney transport chief, um, a post that he um, quit, I don't know if quit's quite the right word, but that, that he left um, well, when leaving London earlier this year. Um, when he quit, um, lots of people were very, very upset and the people who were campaigning against local traffic networks were really delighted because John is, um, amongst other things, definitely the king of the LTNs. So um, without further ado, I'd like to hear his thoughts on the Silvertown Tunnel. Over to you. So you can't, that's better. Um, I assume you can hear me now? Okay. I mean, obviously there's been some great speakers so far. Uh, and I was rather hoping I'd come in first, so. Um, that some of the best stats weren't um, stolen already. However, I think it is worth kind of reiterating some of these things because the enormity of the issue that we face and the kind of numbers that we face as environmentalists, I think, just cannot be emphasized enough. And I think placing um, Silvertown Tunnel in 
firstly a a broader international or national certainly national context i think is important to begin with um you know some of the other panelists have spoken about the fact that um transport emissions represent circa 28 percent of, of uk emissions and surface transport represents around 22 percent of that total um, and as people have noted unlike other sectors such as the power sector which is you know, laudably seen in its uh, carbon intensity fall in recent years we've not only seen emissions from surface transport grow uh, as a proportion of the uk's overall um, emissions but we've seen them grow in absolute terms as well and the reason for that is because um, a policy failure a policy failure that has allowed the number of motor vehicles on the roads of the united kingdom to double to 40 million or almost 40 million in 30 years and the simple fact is um is that without an appropriate policy response to constrain demand for and usage of motor vehicles um there is a very strong um i think pressure on those in control of both the strategic road transport network and the local road transport network and, and crucially a justification for these people to advance the interests of um, those who are operating motor vehicles to the exclusion um, of the many other people in society uh, that suffer the negative externalities of pollution, of noise, of the fact that you know we will have to live with the consequences of um, our spiraling um, emissions and its impact on the climate. Um, and so, you know, that, that failure has led us to the position that we're in today. And one of the kind of, you know, responses of policymakers, rather than seeking to constrain the usage and ownership of motor vehicles has been to provide additional road capacity. Now, the people who built um, the kind of uh, flyovers, which are now being demolished all over the Western world, including one in Birkenhead, which is where I kind of largely grew up down the road from, um, could be forgiven for the mistakes that they made in the mid-20th century um, of thinking that if you build more road capacity, it will ease congestion. But we cannot, I think, offer the same level of forgiveness to transport planners and policymakers today who are in possession of more than half a century's worth of academic literature that demonstrates clearly that if we build road roads cars will fill them without any appropriate measures to constrain the uses of those roads and so that is the situation and the principal justification for the silver town tunnel from the perspective of people who would like to see it built that we have congestion on london's roads and we have congestion partially you know in, as a result of too few river crossings in their view um, east of uh, east of Tower Bridge, um, and um, and that the answer is to build more road capacity. And what I've been very clear about, and what I was very clear about as a cabinet member in Hackney when I was representing the interests of its two hundred and ninety-eight thousand residents, many of whom still rank, despite what you may hear about Hackney being heavily gentrified, amongst the poorest people in the United Kingdom, the most heavily afflicted by uh, pollution which is largely the result of surface transport in fact when i took over the role before i introduced four new low well five new low traffic neighborhoods um you know 40 school streets in a year um and a lot of uh, new bus priority and kilometers worth of segregated cycling and active travel infrastructure you know hackney had the sixth highest premature mortality rate related to uh, pollution of 418 local authorities. Um, and those figures are, you know, the, the, the boroughs of East London uh, invariably rank amongst the top 10 boroughs most afflicted by air pollution in the whole of the United Kingdom. So the idea of building not just kind of more infrastructure, but the kind of, which I've described in the past, the kind of 20th century infrastructure that will only serve to massively increase surface transport emissions magnifying the uk's outsized contribution to the climate crisis but also 
uh, the air pollution impacts of surface transport on the people of East London is absolutely unconscionable. Um, and I have appealed on numerous occasions, both to the mayor, and I'm not here to attack the mayor or his advisors. I think in many respects, particularly under Will Norman, um, I think that you know this mayoralty has done some excellent things on active travel and service transport. And I'm here to both support that administration and indeed any administration of any political stripe that will work to prevent my children from having to live through a, a genuine climate apocalypse. And this isn't kind of my subjective tinfoil hatted view. You know, Simon, I think, has illustrated quite clearly the magnitude of the crisis we face. You know, the 1.5 degree report of the IPCC is the result of the contributions of the dedicated contributions of literally thousands of climate scientists and physicists and leaders in their fields academically. Um, you know, this isn't the bugbear of, you know, environmentalists and campaigners like me, you know, the serious people are now terrified about the implications of our failure to deal with spiraling emissions. And so I've made the point consistently that you cannot build your way out of the climate crisis and you can't crucially build your way out of congestion. And five minutes after Silvertown Tunnel is open without extensive remedial measures, to curtail the use of that tunnel, which of course would completely undermine its business case in the first instance. It will fill up and the roads of East London will fill up. And the argument some of those policymakers will make is that the government has now set a distant deadline for the phasing out of diesel and petrol vehicles. But I'm afraid those people are not engaged with either the broader international scientific literature or the government's own official advisors in the sixth carbon budget. And they're also not engaged with the physics of how motor vehicles function. They don't realize clearly that more than 50% on average of the emissions associated with the operation of motor vehicles come from abrasion of tires and brake pads. So irrespective of whether or not you're driving a motor vehicle that's producing zero emissions at the tailpipe, the legacy of the Silvertown Tunnel will be to massively magnify um, the air pollution crisis, particularly related to the emission of toxic PM2 0.5 and PM10 particles in the lungs of the children of some of the poorest family, not just poor families and neighbourhoods, not just in London, but in the entire United Kingdom. So there's a very strong environmental case against the Silvertown Tunnel. I think previous speakers have already made that. But there's also an extremely strong social argument against the Silvertown Tunnel. And that is that some of the most vulnerable people in London to whom um, we have subjected a poor in air quality for decades are likely to see the quality of their lives suffer further still. And I, while well, I would encourage those policy makers who continue to back the Silver Town Tunnel is to, is to examine their consciences on this issue and ask themselves if it really is consistent with their purported commitment to social justice because there's nothing that I can see in the Silvertown Tunnel that will magnify the life chances of, of the people of East London and that too I was elected to represent and that was who the councillors of the seven boroughs who lodged objections to uh, the Silvertown Tunnel were elected to represent and I think it's very important that the City Hall administration takes a step back and asks itself, ask, ask itself why it is such a lonely figure on this issue, why right across the political spectrum there is a unified voice against the Silvertown Tunnel on environmental grounds and on social grounds. And so whilst I recognise that the trajectory of this project appears to be in one direction, I think it's important that we continue um, to make our case loudly against its construction. And in the event of its construction, I think what we cannot do is afford to wave the white flag and say, the infrastructure is now built and we must accept that it's going to make this contribution. Some grandiose claims have been made, I think, by City Hall as to how they will commute the emissions associated with the operation of this tunnel. And we need to be, whilst I think continuing to make the case against Silvertown Tunnel, 
also make the case against the operation to solve the town tunnel in the way we know it will operate. And I think it's extremely important that we work with City Hall to come good on the promises that they've made, which is effectively to bankrupt, it, bankrupt its own project. Because if, it, if, if, if tolls were to function in London in the way that we believe they ought to function, they deter the motor vehicles that uh, intend to use some of this infrastructure and undermine the case for it altogether. I think a final point I would make is, I think it that politicians... It has final ones. Very final. Sorry, Kate. I think a final point I would make is, is that I was never afraid as a politician power, we can stop things. And it does concern me that politicians sometimes feel that they're kind of passengers of a process that's out with their control, when ultimately it's within the gift of the Mayor of London to stop this project. And I think that the Mayor of London sees that potentially as a highly embarrassing um, garden bridge type scenario for him. Um, and what I would say is, is that I believe that he will not only secure his legacy as a mayor that pioneered a reduction in service transport emissions if he has the moral courage to refuse to proceed with this project, but he will earn the respect of people across London who want to see a politician hold their hands up and say, I got it wrong. Look at the climate that we're operating at the moment. We've just had a health secretary that has gone in the teeth of all opposition from the Prime Minister. And I think the public are looking to politicians to say when they get things wrong, to hold their hands up and say, actually, I thought about this again. London's population has fallen by almost a million people in a year. Not only do I believe that we can no longer justify um, the, the, the tunnel, um, the construction of the tunnel, but actually I want to see the mayor reverse his decision on the walking and cycling bridge that he canned in the same week as he announced the introduction of the Silver Town Tunnel. It's not just about abolishing the things that we don't want. We've also got to help this mayoralty to advocate for the things that we want to see. And I'll continue to be with you. And I know many people right across the labour movement who are highly opposed to this project. And I'm sorry for having monopolised so much of your time, but as you can see, this is a, an issue that is very close to my heart. Thank you, John. Again, you'd be able to hear the applause if it weren't all muted. <laughs> Um, and uh, I'm sure we're going to have lots of questions later about how do we persuade him to do the right thing and how do we persuade the City Hall administration. But hold that thought. Um, we're now going to hear from Izzy Hickmott, who is um, um, from Labour for a Green New Deal and also the National Education Union. And um, let's hear from Izzy straight away. Thank you, Kate. Um, yeah, I'm not going to hold everyone too long. I think a lot of the major points have been made. Um, for me, the Silver Town Tunnel is a very personal thing. I was born in Newham in Canning Town, um, and I, was, I grew up and I live in um, Greenwich. So it really kind of affects me both emotionally and also health wise. Um, going back to the points about the local area and the impact, I mean, if you look at Newham, Newham is the most heavily polluted borough in our country. And to say the Silver Sun Tunnel will actually reduce air, um, air pollution is not really grasping a good understanding of how pollution works. As we've already heard, when you build roads, you induce traffic. It creates capacity and it attracts people onto the roads. But what makes Silver Town Tunnel even more baffling is the fact that if you were to say, well, the Silver Town Tunnel is necessary because the Blackwood Tunnel is no longer for the purpose, it is a very old tunnel, it is always closing, um, it does have its problems. But to then go and build a tunnel with twice the capacity, which will then fit HDVs and that's what really gets me. I mean if this is an argument about air pollution, reducing traffic and you know creating a good alternative um, 
at the Blackpool Tunnel, why on earth are you putting HGVs down there? I can't, I, this is the one I can't get my head around. There is no air pollution argument for putting HGVs down the tunnel. And to, to kind of make the situation worse, there are plans in Newham to build a multi-storey distribution centre for HGVs. And it just does not add up. I mean, like John said, the mayor has done some fantastic things in London with very limited resources to help with air pollution. And this tunnel is not even his idea. This tunnel is uh, Boris Johnson's idea. So he has plenty of reason to turn around and say, we must stop this. But at the very least, he needs to put med med huge mitigation. In. And also to say that tolling is going to stop the usage. Well, this is a big misconception about how tolls work. Um, I'm, a, I'm an economics teacher. I don't want to bore you with details of economics, but at the end of the day, um, the demands for car use is what we call an economics. It's very inelastic. And what that means is it takes a considerably large amount of taxation to deter people from using cars. And the reason for that is people perceive, don't perceive a, a viable alternative. So if you ask most car drivers, and I'm a car driver myself, okay, why do you use your cars? Why do you go to work in your cars? Why do you rely so much on your cars? And they'll say to you, it's because the alternatives are either not viable or not cheap enough or, or clean enough. So for example, if you want to cycle, do we have good enough cycle mate? Okay, I cycle, I cycle a lot, right? um, but I cycle along the riverside because I will not go on the roads. I don't think the roads are safe anymore. Um, I use public transport. I didn't drive until I was 28, but it's so expensive, okay? Particularly the railways. And, and you've got to think about, I live in South East London, the connection of public transport in South East London, you're talking about double or triple the journey times if you're using public transport in comparison to cars. People with their huge busy lifestyles, um, we have some of the longest working hours in Europe, don't have the time to wait for public transport, to pay those e exceptionally high prices, to sit in over COVID buses. We need to have a joined up approach. And to say to people, oh, we're going to toll it, that's going to stop them, they won't. People will pay that. And the problem is, the people who are on average incomes or low incomes who drive, they're going to be the most affected. People in the higher incomes won't care. And to have any major impact, you would have to do what you do in London. You have to put, you would have to put the charge up to 15 pounds to have any impact. And what will end up happening is people will be resentful. People will be extremely angry because they'll see people in higher incomes being able to afford to use cars and then driving through central London. So we've got to have a joined up approach to this. We can't just say, you know, tax, taxation will solve the problem because it won't. Um, and we've also got to be honest and say that at the end of the day, we can't really see electric cars as a vehicle. I know this has been mentioned before, as a, a vehicle for change. Because what, at the end of the day, electric cars are highly polluted. We've already say, seen, spoken about how they will increase particular matter. But the energy consumption that is needed to fuel these cars, I mean, my understanding of the figures are if we converted all our vehicles um, to electric vehicles by um, 2050, um, we would have to double electricity generation on the national grid. So even the most optimistic um, experts on this say that this can only be met uh, with renewables by 50%. So where's that other 50% going to come from? That increase in energy generation from electric vehicles has to come from somewhere. And if you can't meet it by renewables, you'll have to build fossil fuel um, power stations or nuclear power stations. So we have a real dilemma here. You know, just, just trying to, just thinking that electric cars will solve all our problem is a big mistake. So I'm really concerned. I'm also, as a, a, you know, an active campaigner, really concerned about the effect it will have on the most vulnerable in society. We're talking about a tunnel that will go into Newham. 
who has some of the biggest biggest areas of social deprivation um, and the impact it's having on communities um, you're bringing in traffic from outside of London the majority of traffic through the Blackwall Tunnel comes from outside of London and you're putting that into the um, poorest communities so there is a huge social justice uh, element to this as well uh, particularly as people most of the people driving from outside of London aren't, aren't going to be from the same communities as in Newham um, you have a huge population of people from a diverse range of ethnic backgrounds in those areas. So you're dumping your pollution onto those people. So what I'll say to the, uh, my plea to the mayor is, please review this. Let's sit down. Let's talk about it. You know, all aspects of it, from cancellation to mitigation. We really need to sit down and have a constructive debate about this because there are so many people within the Labour Party and outside that see the disaster. And this is really going to hurt Sadiq Khan. He really has. I think Sadiq Khan has very few ambitions as a politician. And this will really, really damage him long term because this, you know, particularly once it's built and when all these problems start occurring, this is going to be hugely damaging for him. So he really needs to, to think about what he's doing. Thank you. Thank you, Izzy. Once again, applause. Let's, if you can't hear it because they're all muted. Um, so our final speaker is Sean Berry, um, long-term campaigner against the tunnel, as many of you have been actually, and um, London Assembly member for the Green Party. So I'll hand you over to Sean. Thanks so much, Kate. Thank you to all of the speakers so far and the fantastic campaigners from the Silvertown Tunnel Coalition. Um, there's genuine momentum now, I think, behind stopping it. And there's so much sense being talked today by everybody. So many of you genuinely get it. Some of these things that you're saying about your know, new roads create traffic. When I used to be a transport campaigner working with Becca, in fact, we'd, we'd run around saying this, new roads create new traffic. And it was like, really, do they? Is it not going to relieve the congestion? And now this is much better known by many, many more people. And it's genuinely throughout East London now, I think people get this. Um, as mentioned, I'm one of three Green Assembly members since uh, the elections in May. I was elected in 2016 and I followed 16 years of there being uh, two or three London Assembly members from the Green Party the whole time. And I'm a veteran of working with them to try and stop the, the previous scheme to this, the Thames Gateway Bridge, um, which was cancelled in 2008. And I've been working to try and stop this scheme from coming forward since 20. 13 when it was first brought forwards. So yeah, today I want to talk about not so much the, we've heard from everybody, you know, the, the technical, the climate case against the scheme. Um, I don't want to talk about those kinds of details. I, I don't want to talk about the, the policy reasons for stopping it, but I want to talk about the practical legislative and political issues and how close we are, I think, to making a review of this and the cancellation of this scheme inevitable. I think the question that remains is, will the machine start digging before the current mayor realises this inevitability? Um, and will how much we can all contribute towards changing his mind? I'm really pleased to hear what John said just now, because that's such a clear voice from within the Labour Party. And I wonder how long it is since John had a meeting with the current mayor, because that's a very persuasive argument you've got with you there now. Um, the key fact, and John mentioned it too, the current mayor has the power to stop this. He could decide tomorrow to pause and review this scheme just like Wales have done. He could do that in order to allow more time for more evidence to come forwards to really, you know, if he thinks it's the right thing, let's give time to make sure of it. Uh, my colleague, Zach Polanski, who's a new Green London Assembly member since, since May, tackled the mayor at Mayor's Question Time last week about how long it is since the wider public in London have had their say about this, since he really asked opposition politicians, his own politicians on the ground, what they thought. And, and it is absolutely ages. It was October and November 2015 that the statutory consultation on the planning application took, part, took place. Um, Becca said there um, earlier on that, it, you know, at that point, under the, the current planning policies, it didn't actually matter what climate arguments 
we made at that point. It was going to get approval in the planning process. And that is genuinely the last time we were asked specifically about the Silvertown Road Tunnel. Um, Zach tackled the mayor about this and he, the mayor pointed out that he's also consulted since then on his transport strategy and there was the election this year, which he won, obviously. I didn't win it. He pointed that out quite clearly. Um, but no, I mean, the transport strategy that the mayor put forward was for a package of things to happen in this part of London, including, and I've got the list here, um, a new pedestrian and cycle bridge linking Rotherhithe and Canary Wharf, a DLR crossing at Galleons Reach, a London Overground crossing at Barking Riverside, um, a new ferry. Literally all that's left of all these pledges that were in this package is the Silvertown Road Tunnel. The other things have been cancelled. So that strategy, transport strategy consultation counts for nothing now. And in his 2021 manifesto, he did not mention the Silvertown Tunnel once it only it was only when I brought it up or Louisa Porrick to her credit the Lib Dem at Hustings that he was forced to talk about it and he didn't talk about it at Hustings in ways that were genuinely enthusiastic either he kept bringing up how this was in fact a scheme from Boris Johnson and waving it at Sean Bailey the Conservative no one really thinks this scheme is a great idea we just have to persuade the mayor that it's good for him and good for London to cancel it now. Now, I think Becca's team are doing an amazing job at the moment because the legislation, I mean, we, I said a lot has changed in terms of what the public want and, and what the climate rules are. And you've talked quite clearly about that, Simon. But Becca's work challenging the, the roads policies that were at the heart of this getting permission are absolutely crucial here. I think if you win against the road investment strategy, and to be clear, the, the Silvertown Tunnel is not being funded from the road investment strategy that Becca's challenging this week in uh, the courts. Um, it's obviously being funded by tolls. But if the government's investment in roads gets challenged successfully in the courts, then there's a clear, clear argument to put to the mayor that he needs to rethink his own investment in roads. And then more directly, the national policy statement of roads in which Silvertown is, is, is named, I think, and that obviously supports Silvertown directly. It's the reason it was approved against all the objections in the planning application. Um, that, if that falls, then Silvertown is doomed in terms of its um, reasoning. Um, we've also got new air pollution legislation coming forward. We've got the things that the Committee on Climate Change has said that Simon talked about. We've also got within London, you know, wider policies coming forward, like, for example, more integrated, fairer, smarter road charging, where the tolls for this would sit really weirdly. Um, it does need rethinking. So I think, you know, just any one of these things is a good enough reason to say to the mayor, go away, pause and review this scheme. And he looks really, he's genuinely sk skating on thin ice by continuing to refuse to do this. At some point, he's going to cross a legal line, will be able to challenge in refusing to take into account these changes. Now, that's the legislative thing. I think it's you know genuinely on thin ice now. And the only question is, will these dominoes fall before the machines start to, to dig into the ground? Politically, the list of growing opposition is absolutely huge. Like the Labour politicians coming behind it are just growing right across London. I've got a list here of 70s from a week or so ago, and it's probably changed since then. I think I've got 17 uh, constituency Labour parties who've passed motions against it. I've got many, many more ward Labour teams who've passed motions against it. These are these motions presumably are all resulting in letters to the mayor from members of his own party, from the chairs of these these um, constituency and ward parties who are saying, why don't you think about it again? And then, so I think you know, there's cross party opposition to this. Um, we've got conservative members in the London Assembly as well signed up. There's many, many people from lots of different parties. This is starting to look like the mayor is very, very lonely politically on this. And then, of course, in the in the wider sense of politics, because obviously politics is, you know, parties and arguing on the telly and all of those kinds of things. But really, politics is about representing what the people want. And during the past year, during the past several years, you know, where groups like Mums for Lungs have sprung up, where we've started to see ground 
um, from the ground up, grassroots campaigns demanding changes in their local areas. It's really clear that the people out there want different transport policies so much. They want cities that don't require them to drive, that, that don't leave them driven upon by other people, that but they have less traffic, that have better and cheaper public transport, where the new river crossings are for bikes people um, and buses and, and trams and, and the DLR and not cars and above all people want clean air to breathe and safe streets to live their lives these are changes in public opinion it's time the mayor really started to listen to the kind of positive things that we could spend the money on um, and the, the latest estimate we made i mean the 2.2 billion number was calculated by our team in city hall based on um, information that came out about what we'd signed in the contract to pay the, under the PFI scheme in, in, in income, from our toll income. Um, and that was done very, very generously using quite a low uh, measure of inflation. If you use more realistic measures of inflation, the cost is closer to two and a half billion pounds. And that's the direct opportunity cost for investing in those things that people want. So there you go. People want a transformation in transport in London. The Silvertown Tunnel is a big new road that plays absolutely no part in anyone's future vision of what London should be like. We just have to get the mayor to realise this. He is the one who can make the decision tomorrow to change this. And if he won't, we have some real opportunities coming up to persuade him that he absolutely has to. So keep up the good work, everybody, and let's have a good discussion about what we do next. Uh, thank you, Sean, who's also co-leader of the Green Party. Um, so I'll open it up to the floor. I think the best way of us doing this is if you know how to put up the hand on, um, put up your hand on the chat, uh, not on the chats, on the um, on Zoom. 